Our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Vijayendra Ranjan Varro. Uh, Vijay was trained in UK uh, on neonatology, and he's currently a consultant neonatologist at Singapore General Hospital. And his special interests uh, will focus on ethical issues in perinatal medicine and neonatology neurology. Okay, Vijay, please. Uh, good morning, and um, thank you to the organizers for having us here and a truly memorable dinner last night for those who attended. Um, just like Dr. Bill, who's left the room at the moment, um, I sat down when I was given this talk uh, with one of my trainees, and I said, look, I've got 15 minutes um, to talk about neonatal encephalopathy. What should I focus on? And she said, well, it's, uh, you know, the vast majority of the audience are going to be non-neonatologists, so you need to explain a little bit about neonatal encephalopathy. It's an ethics conference, so you surely need to talk about ethics. And there are going to be a lot of trainees and, you know, people who want some guidance. So point them in the right direction. So I will try. And um, my talk is on neonatal encephalopathy, but a lot of this reflects all across, you know, neonatal intensive care and pediatric critical care as well. Okay, so what is neonatal encephalopathy? It is uh, a syndrome of altered consciousness, abnormalities in tone, and seizures. And uh, this happens to a baby shortly after birth, term babies, and uh, various etiologies, but by far the commonest is intrapartum asphyxia. It's a huge global health burden um, after uh, infections and prematurity, it's the leading cause of neonatal mortality. And the biggest brunt is borne by, you know, the low and middle income countries. Uh, what has been a huge development in neonatal medicine over the past decade has been therapeutic hypothermia, or brain cooling, which reduces death or disability by up to 50%. But I think it reflects a failure in the neonatal community that you know, for that other 50%, we really haven't been able to do much. Um, so, going by my sort of colleague's words, uh, how does cooling work and what does it look like? So, this is a baby who's uh, being cooled. So, when we say cooling, we nurse babies at about 36.5 degrees. And when we cool them, we bring down the body temperature to 33.5. And we keep it at that temperature for about 72 hours. And the cooling is provided by this blanket or wrap, and you can see the baby is critically ill, ventilated. So this is what it looks like. So the baby is kind of, you know, moribund, sedated, quite often on multiple anticonvulsants, has all sorts of lines and electrodes uh, stuck in its scalp, is on brain monitoring. And at the end of 72 hours, the baby is warmed up, and uh, then we do MRIs and sit down with the family and, you know, all sorts of things. So um, it is... Whoops, I'm trying to go on to the next slide. Yeah, so it is a big deal for a family that comes in expecting, you know, a full-term pregnancy without any problems, suddenly to be sort of put in this very, very difficult scenario. And uh, I, I'm sure most of my neonatal colleagues in the audience will agree that, um, you know, we have guidance for extreme prematurity, we have guidance for lethal congenital malformations, but this group of babies, these term babies where we did not expect any problem, these are some of the most difficult ethical challenges that we deal with. And as people have alluded to over the last day or two, you know, advances in medical treatment are great, but it opens up a whole can of ethical worms. And this is one of the things that we deal with in this scenario as well. There's this really nice website, uh, Hope for HIE, for both families and medics who lo look after babies with HIE. And this is a poem I saw this week uh, of a family that comes in, you know, a perfect baby boy, born breathless, cooled, brain dead, uh, mother's tears, family gathers, cherished son is held with love, and, you know, in the blink of an eye, that life ends. And 
it is a really difficult situation to be in. We've talked about autonomy, and over the last 30, 40 years, I think autonomy has kind of superseded best interests in kind of the ethical pillars. But it is not an option for that baby in the NICU, and it is kind of replaced by parental authority. And parents are surrogate decision makers for this little baby. And it is the legal view that parents are, you know, best placed to make decisions for the baby and the family. And we're generally accepting of that. But I will give you this uh, case illustration to kind of highlight where it becomes a difficult ethical challenge. So this is baby X, term baby. Mother wakes up, 2 o'clock in the morning, massive abruption at home. She's blue lighted into the hospital. Baby d is delivered by crash cesarean section. Extensive resuscitation, severely encephalopathic, and begins, begins cooling treatment at about three and a half hours of life. And over the next week, the baby is warmed up at about 72 hours, um, has a trial of extubation which fails. The neurological exam is extremely concerning. It's absence of gag, the baby's neurology is abnormal, the baby is fitting. And at this point in time, the neonatal, the neonatal team are very concerned about what might be the outcome for this baby. The baby has an MRI, and this is a picture that, you know, when we see it, our heart sinks. So what you can see is the deep gray matter that controls our motor function is severely injured along with the peri peri cortex which di dictates much of our motor function. And this is the EEG, or the cerebral function monitor. And you can see at the end of the week, you know, it looks pretty dire for those who kind of uh, read these things. And when you put all this together, it is fairly certain that the outcome is not going to be good for the baby. So the neonatal sit down with the parents and kind of express their concerns. And we hear this term once in a while. Parents wish to go all out with intensive treatment. And, um, you know, Brian Carter, who was here five, six years back, kind of explained this very well when he said, we really need to understand what parents mean when they say we want to go all out. It's a term that we kind of use very loosely. And does it mean everything available? We want everything done? Everything that is possible, so if it's not possible to put this baby on a heart-lung bypass machine, don't do it. Everything imaginable. We've heard about novel treatments in the last day or two. Or does it mean that I want treatment for my baby that might help, but I don't want my baby hurt? So we really need to understand when we use the term everything done. And uh, where are the parents coming from, you know, when they express this? And what are the possible reasons? And this has been explored in several papers and a most recent study that was pu published in the archives this week. Uh, what are the possible reasons? And as one of my colleagues from India sort of mentioned, parents, you know, they have that hope, right? We as medics kind of talk about prognosis and, you know, chances of survival, death. But for the parents, that's all they have. Um, perceptions of quality of life. You know, is a child who relies on physical aids, is that quality good or bad? And we might have different perceptions. Anticipated regret or guilt. So what does this mean? Am I making the wrong decision when I say, okay, let's go for terminal extubation? Might my baby have lived and did I make that wrong decision? So this is a huge kind of thing at the back of the parents' mind. You know, they're going through enormous stresses at that time. Are they able to make a well-informed decision, you know, in that very stressful period? Are they in denial about the diagnosis? Do they really understand when we kind of, you know, throw all these statistics and, you know, medical terminology to them? We don't know. And, you know, in particularly in this part of the world, religion, spirituality, belief in miracles plays a huge role in decision making. And um, this is a study done from Sweden by Nassif, and there's been several studies done by him after that. And I showed you the video of the baby who was cooled, lifeless, cold, sedated, on anticonvulsants. 
And when the baby is warmed up at 72 hours, this baby starts pinking up, starts crying, you know, starts stirring, um, sucking on the endotracheal tube. And for parents, this is a sign of rebirth. As this father says, it was an incredible feeling. It was almost like becoming a father twice. So it gives them that sense of hope, seeing that moribund baby suddenly come to life. Uh, we're going to talk about this this afternoon, I'm sure, by Professor Rosalind in her lecture. But uh, And we discussed this yesterday in that very healthy debate between Julian and um, uh, Dominic. Uh, can we override parental authority? And legally, I believe this is quite difficult to do because the law kind of gives a lot of responsibility for the parents. And we generally accept parental authority unless it is against the baby's best interest. And that, get, that corridor between benefit and harm is too wide. So to give you an example, refusing treatment that might prevent significant harm, suffering, or death. And many people have used you know, giving blood products as a good example of this. So the right to treatment, something against the baby's interest. So the baby is you know, terminally ill pretty much surviving on the ventilator and the parents want to go all out. We want ECMO for this baby. So that kind of best interest, right to mercy, as uh, one of the American ethicists kind of calls this. And this has kind of been explored by D.A. and as I said, we're probably going to discuss this in more detail this afternoon. So where do we come from as the medics? And um, the Royal College, of which Many of us are members, you know, quite often gets things wrong. But one of the things that they do really well is publish very good guidelines. And uh, there was a guideline in 2004 when I was a trainee, which we all sort of followed. And this has been superseded by this guideline, which Dominic is a co-author of. And they kind of sort of state a few states where it may be against the baby's best interest to continue intensive care in neonatology, for example. And these are some of the conditions. Dominic here again kind of has talked about this concept of window of opportunity, where you have this therapeutic window where if, for example, you extubate the baby, it's very certain or highly certain that the baby is not going to live. Your prognosis is not completely sure, but you have that opportunity moment where you can kind of, let's say, compassionately extubate the baby. And if you miss that window, you're more certain about the prognosis, but there is high chance that the baby might survive. And this is you know, something that's been written by Dominic before and kind of quoted very often in ethics papers. But one of the criticisms, Dominic, forgive me for saying this, is that there may be some limitation in kind of deciding prognosis. And for example, the baby who's being cooled, sedated on anticonvulsants, how do you really make a good clinical assessment of a baby in that situation. You know, we often rely on MRIs, EEGs, but all these have their limitations as well. And we don't have a good biomarker that tells us this is good, this is bad. Huge advances in medical care, uh, rehab, MDT care, which, you know, might improve the baby's outcomes. And one of the criticisms of, you know, this concept of window of opportunity is are we going against the, dub the doctrine of the double effect? Are we hastening death when death may not have been a certainty? Does, you know, if we are so confident that this baby is going to die, does the baby need a window? You know, can we not wait a little while? And, you know, the other sort of uh, criticism, if I may say so, and apologies once again, is, is death ever opportune? And these are some of the things for us to reflect on. And um, we kind of looked at this when we looked at, you know, the first 60, 65 babies that we had cooled when uh, I was uh, a doctor in the UK. And uh, of the 63 babies we had cooled, 50 survived. And of those 50, eight had severe asphyxia. So we kind of looked at their clinical history, MRI, EEG, and put all these together and kind of graded them into mild, moderate, and severe. And out of the eight babies who had severe asphyxia, five babies we had actually redirected care. And, uh, sorry, um, five of the babies who we had redirected care sort of survived, you know, uh, who had severe asphyxia. 
And when we looked at their 24-month 24 out, 24 outcomes, two had CP, grade four and five, but the other three had you know, a bit of learning difficulty, hearing loss, one of the kids' concerns about autism. And this again brings us back to the discussion about quality of life. So are we to say that these babies have a poor quality of life? And um, we don't know. And uh, one of the things, and you know, this is a baby that, uh, the first baby in that table who sort of kept, you know, correspond, the family kept corresponding with me even after I moved here. And we did a survey on, you know, uh, these babies who were cooled. And one of the things that they said was, you know, which was really, you know, a good take home message for me personally was that we felt pressurized into choosing to remove life support. And had we known what we know now, on hindsight, we would have made a dif different you know, decision. So something to think about. And the other pillar of ethics that we all talk about is justice. Now we have you know, participants from the South Asian subcontinent, huge burden of asphyxia in this country, these countries. And one of the landmark studies in neonatology over the last few years has been the Helix trial, looking at outcomes of babies cooled in resource-limited settings. When you know, therapeutic hypothermia came about, there was a huge interest, and there is still a huge interest in low middle income countries, and we get you know, colleagues from there telling us, can you share your guidelines, can you put pressure on the ministries to kind of you know, incorporate hypothermia as part of you know, the healthcare package. But the outcomes from the Helix trial were disappointing. So in 400 odd babies that were, cool, you know, 400 babies that were included in the trial, 200 cooled, 200 not there was almost a 12% difference in mortality and morbidity in the babies that were cooled compared to the babies that were not cooled. So the recommendation is that cooling should not be the standard of care in low middle income countries. And this poses a huge ethical question. Now, we have delegates from Bangalore and um, um, Velour leading centers of cooling research in you know, the subcontinent. And they will say, look, you've done all these trials on our babies. We've shown you it's possible. And now you're telling us you can't do it. You know, is that fair? And uh, or you may have a center in Mumbai, you know, India's G20 economy now, state of the art ECMO tertiary neonates. Would that neonatologist there say that, you know, we can do this as well as you in Singapore, for example. So this throws open the whole debate of justice and equal care for all. Resource allocation, something that various people have mentioned. Should health services be pouring resources into high-tech neonatology? Or could that money be used for vaccinations for the greater good? Difficult ethical question to comprehend. And in the last few minutes, in terms of going back to what should we do next, this is a really good kind of template which I personally kind of follow. And this is by Dr. Mercurio, a neonatologist at Yale who kind of breaks up et ethical dilemmas into, is it permissible, impermissible, or should treatment be obligatory? And when we are faced with an ethical conundrum, we could use this kind of template to see where we stand. Uh, and, you know, the most difficulty would be in that middle column, where is it permissible? And when we say, is it permissible, is it advisable? For example, a baby who needs vaccines. Yes, it's not compulsory for most vaccinations in Singapore, for example, but is it advisable? Is it inadvisable or is it futile? And this is again a term that has been used quite often over the last uh, day or two. And quite often where we are in this line is guided by prognosis and this line is not static, it's dynamic. So you might have a baby who's got severe encephalopathy, where we are sort of all doom and gloom with the parents, and four days later the baby actually is kind of responding to what we're doing. So that line starts shifting. Or we may have a baby preterm, 24 week or doing great, suddenly has NEC, you know, and the surgeon, it's an open and shut laparotomy. Should we kind of continue intensive care? And that line might then move to futile. So this line changes all the time, but what is most important is parents deserve to know all permissible options. I can't provide that treatment for this neuromuscular disorder in my hospital, but hospital down that road can, 
and maybe we ought to consult them or maybe we might need to shift your care to that hospital. So parents need to know all the options that are available. And then this brings to the point, you know, this term, again, which we use fairly f loosely, futile. What does futile mean? Futile mean, might mean different things to different people. But ultimately, futile, futility is dictated by what is the goal of treatment. So you have a baby asphyxiated on life support. Father is on you know, business in the US. It's going to take him 24 hours to come to Singapore. We need to keep the baby alive for the family's sake. Is it futile? Probably not. Is it futile to kind of explore novel treatments? Stem cell therapy in a baby who's got irreversible brain injury? It's largely experimental. Yes, it is. Um, so it depends on you know, what is our goal when we say treatment is futile or not. Again, another excellent piece of documentation from the college about brain death. And this is, again, something that comes up because it means different things to different people. Uh, so this is diagnosis of death by neurological criteria in babies term and up to two months where they have to meet certain, endo certain conditions before doing brain death testing. And you want to rule out you know, other causes. You want to make sure that the baby is off sedation, off neuromuscular blockade. And in cool babies in particular, the baby has to be warmed. And you have to kind of observe these babies for about 24 hours before you do brain dead testing. Uh, and then these are some of the tests that you can do. So suggested frameworks for ethical decision making. I don't have all the answers, but what is the question? What is the ethical question we are dealing with? Get all the facts. What is the data out there in terms of you know, survival, futility, poor outcomes, etc. Accommodating goals and reaccommodating where we stand on that kind of IPO framework. Shared decision making. Again, something that has been kind of um, spoken quite a bit in the past day or so. Um, and professional, professional humility. I mean, you know, we can't look into a crystal ball and say, this is what is going to happen tomorrow. We can't be certain what the benefit or harm of treatment might be. You know, we're not sure that this treatment really benefits your baby. Say, I don't know. Uh, you know, parents may, might, you know, Prof. Roy Joseph yesterday was giving us an example of, you know, families wanting fetal uh, pregnancies without fetal heart monitoring. Is it safe to do that? You know, it, we just need to be upfront with families and say, look, we wouldn't advise this, but if another center is doing it, by all means, you are free to choose. And um, lastly, in terms of uh, some sort of uh, guidance on where we sort of, how we might manage these uh, babies and you know, these ethical dilemmas, this is a neat little book, sorry, a bit of self-promotion here, under the stewardship of Prof. Roy Joseph, and there are a couple of members in the audience, Dr. Yo, Daisy, and To, uh, if she's around. Um, several of us were kind of involved in putting this together and my very clever 13 year old son then put this QR code for me and said dad just get the audience to take a picture and it's there on their phone so for people who want to some sort of guidance as to what we should do please do feel free to kind of download this thank you very much